Okay, our next talk will be about Nick's make. Let's welcome Toby M. Hi, um, very glad to be here and um, that I'm able to show off uh, my little toy project to you. So um, at work, I um, have to deal with a lot of C++ code. And um, as some of you might know, C++ is kind of slow to compile, especially um, when you have a lot of templates and headers and you have to wait quite a bit um, for your projects to build. The, the iteration speed is not that quick. And for that, um, you have a lot of build systems like Make and Ninja and CMake and Meson, uh, maybe even Bazel. And um, these are all built to optimize um, the, the, uh, the build iteration so, it, uh, so that you only rebuild the code that actually was touched. Um, at work, we use CMake, and um, that has a lot of features, but lacks some of them. And uh, about a year ago, um, I started uh, having a problem with my laptop. It started overheating. And um, it was actually so bad that it clocked down to 200 megahertz and was completely unusable. And I uh, basically worked around that by using Nix-based remote builds for whenever I did packaging work. So I was able to use Nix build anyway, and um, for packaging, it was uh, common or is common to just rebuild the full code base and then do something else while it builds and let it build somewhere else. But um, for feature work and bug fixing, which I do a lot, that wouldn't work, especially when I was pairing with, um, with colleagues, with coworkers. Um, they either um, I would um, get thrown out of my pairing session or um, they wouldn't hear me anymore and it was useless, basically. Um, so a normal person, I guess, would just deal with that by buying more potent hardware. <laughs> But um, I thought, OK, I can do my packaging stuff with Nix remotely. Why can't I do um, minimal, uh, minimal builds um, with Nix as well? And I started thinking about maybe I can solve this somehow. And um, over two or three weekends late last year, um, I implemented Nix Make. So um, now you know what kind of problem this deals with. Uh, I want to show you a quick demo. Let's see if this switching works. I hope the guys in the back can also read the text. Um, here I have a very small project that basically just um, consists of empty code. Um, there's a couple of um, oh, sorry, a couple of header files, a couple of um, actual source files, and um, they form some dependency graph. That dependency graph is implicit um, with uh, headers in C and C++. And um, then when I want to build this, I have a default Nix um, that uses Nix make to define which objects to build and how to link those objects together. So this is my, my example project. And I have a, wait, a Selnix also, which just pulls in the CLI. And the CLI is actually a around 80 lines um, bash script with very little dependencies. Um, it started out with, I don't know, 10 lines, or, and then grew and grew. And I'm basically at the point where I should rewrite it in something proper, but never got around to it. 
So anyways, um, now I can call nixmake um, dash dash max jobs to actually demonstrate that this also works with remote builds and dash l um, to actually get some output otherwise um, there's uh, only temporary output to see and yeah okay it's actually building and then with a bit of delay you also see the output from the remote build and now I can um, invoke the executable and um, it it built my project and if I now say okay I'm going to edit this file where the actual string that gets returned is defined to um, something else and then I invoke nixmake again we'll see that it's only compiling one source file and linking that into another executable. And that's basically already the core of it. So that's, that's the core feature set I was going for. And um, yeah, let's see. Um, uh, I want to, uh, to show you the API just very quickly because I think um, there's not that much time for it. So there are basically three workhorse functions here. Um, one is the objects function where you say, where you tell the system, um, these are my sources. Um, this is the, the, the full source tree. Um, it gets a name, gets extra sources, so um, it actually supports um, incremental builds with generated sources and with generated headers. So it's not just the proof of concept, it's a little bit more, but so uh, at least good enough to compile what I'm doing at work. Of course, you have to pass in CFLEX for the compiler, and um, if you need any libraries, you pass those as build inputs, propagated build inputs, native build inputs, um, just as in um, make derivation. Um, DB size, I'm going to explain later. Um, then there's the executable function. There's also a library function. I ha don't have a slide for that because it doesn't fit. Um, there's too many inputs to that. Um, so the executable gets the output of the object function and links it together, essentially. Um, you can add additional build inputs, native build inputs. You can tell it to use PKG config, which is the default. And I think I should remove these, uh, this um, flag. Um, you can tell it additional link flags if you need to. And you can define extra outputs um, that you populate in a post build step. So, um, what do we get from sidestepping traditional um, build systems like CMake or Mason and doing it directly in Nix? So, basically, cutting out the middleman. So, um, the output you get is basically directly consumable from something like um, Docker tools or generating app images. So um, you have basically, you write your build scaffold and you don't need to do any packaging on top because the definitions that you write for the build, uh, you kind of get a package out um, automatically. So there's, there's no extra steps to take because you're taking basically the packaging step with it. Um, yeah, you can also use it in CI um, and get the benefits of that there, which is usually not possible in traditional CI setups where you always do a full rebuild. Um, with this setup, you get uh, more reliability that the objects that were built earlier um, can still be linked and are still basically the correct ones. 
Um, so you could even go as far as share um, individual build artifacts from um, your development with the CI, but I normally don't go as far because in CI I enable um, optimizations that take uh, that make the compiler a lot slower, like LTO, and you don't want that in local development. Um, yeah, then you get a nice side benefit because the way it's built um, has the source files as store paths themselves, which means um, when your debug info points to a specific file, you actually get that. And at least in Nix packages, um, when we use uh, make derivation in the standard and the, it's not that way it gets um, yeah, um, unpacked to a source folder in, in the build sandbox first. And um, you have to, to go through some extra hoops when you debug. Um, it subsumes C cache. And that's quite nice when you build uh, one version, then build another version, and then re you revert, normal make files will build again. And this system doesn't. You don't need a Zcash anymore because um, you actually can't do a data delta based build in the same way as um, make files do or, or ninja files. Um, and you can even do distributed compiling, as I showed in the demo. Um, just not as fancy as, um, for example, Bazel, which is really optimized for that, or um, maybe some of you heard of the tool Ice Cream to do really distributed builds. With this, um, you should build mostly on one machine, on one target builder machine, because if you don't, it starts copying um, different outputs back and forth between all the builders um, in some ways unnecessarily, and that's not so great, so only partially. Um, and then, of course, you have a huge ecosystem advantage um, because you have Nix packages directly at your disposal. Um, there are lots of build systems that have an integration or that, that bring this feature where um, they can, you can basically say, uh, I want to use this or that package, but the, the number of things that are actually packaged in these repositories are usually always small and definitely dwarfed when you compare it to Nix packages. So in, when you can use Nix packages directly, you have almost everything and there's very little of extra work that you have to do these days. Um, yeah, and if you do have to adapt some of the packages that are up there, because maybe there is no pkg config file, it's very easy to adapt that, um, because I, Nix make brings uh, a small helper tool to wrap packages with a pkg config. That's on this slide. Um, so basically, if you need to tell your software, you tr um, your, your system that you're trying to build, your compiler, finally, how to link something. Most of the time it's, it's um, linking that you need to um, specialize. Then, um, yeah, you just call this function. You normally just need to use one or two or even no, none of the, um, the options that are available and it just builds a pkg config pc file that um, nixmake then picks up. Um, and I guess some of you wonder how it works um, because um, yeah it took me a while to figure out how I could do this. Um, first of all um, how do make files work? Well they are uh, timestamp based so um, they check all the source files that go into an object, a basically compiled output of the compiler, and uh, check is the modification timestamp newer than the output that exists on the file system. And if 
it is on one of the files, then it rebuilds. But how do it? Uh, how does it figure out what are the exact inputs of an object? And for that, the compiler has this um, capital M flags. There's a whole set of them, but I'm only showing those because they're the, the core, the most important ones. Uh, MD and MMD, they um, add a secondary output to the compiler, a secondary file that it writes where it just lists um, the, the files that went into this specific translation unit. So basically the headers that you included and the transitive headers. And, um, that's the most important part. Um, there are two uh, MMD um, strips out the system headers and MD basically gives you everything. Uh, we're using MD because otherwise it wouldn't work with the um, generated headers. So if you have, otherwise you'd have to um, rebuild everything if the generated header changes and that's also undesirable. Um, so um, what's the trick with NixMake? Because we don't have timestamps, right? Um, well, of course, the only thing we can do is hash all these files. And um, when we compile a file, um, the steps are um, basically, we also use this MD flag, record all the files that went into it. Um, throw away the static store pass again, and um, yeah, then store it as a list of paths in a JSON representation because that's easy to, um, to import into Next code. Um, before compiling a file, if you want to check, do I actually really have to compile this file? Um, we check an object DB if the file path is in there, um, the path has entries and this, these entries are checked um, one after the other and these entries are also lists and you basically compare has the current version of the source code um, a set of input files that are identical to any of the past versions of your source code tree. And if yes, if that's the if that's the case, we reconstruct um, the parameters to the call to construct the object that already exists, so it doesn't have to get rebuilt. Um, if no, at any point we have to just build a new object. Um, yeah, and then finally, was it the object DB? Um, yeah, with every build. Um, the inputs and outputs um, get uh, appended to some project-wide file. How um, this is found, um, maybe I'll explain later if there's time. And um, when the next build starts, we check all these new entries, um, if they were actually realized. If not, we discard them. If yes, um, they get moved over to some um, safe part of this database file that they're actually there, they compiled correctly and the compilation actually went through, it wasn't cancelled. Um, of course, if you do this all the time, this cache grows and grows and never gets smaller. And it's not so easy to age out old entries because you don't know what is really old and what is, no, uh, what is new because the, the outermost structure of this database is a set. And of course, there's a, there's a way to uh, bookkeep all this, but that would complicate things. And I'm not confident that I'm going to keep the structure of this compilation database or object database the same. So I thought, OK, for now, randomize. Um, I actually implemented an XOR shift based PRNG in Nix to be able to do this. But it was still the easier choice compared to adding a lot of bookkeeping. Um, yeah, that's 
basically almost it. There's a lot of things that aren't possible right now. So these are missing features. Um, currently, you can only compile with GCC and Clang because it's really tailored to these and only understands the command lines of these. Um, there's no support for C++20 modules because they require a level of dynamism that is that goes beyond what um, header files do because um, with modules, uh, intermediate compilation outputs are needed to um, to extend the graph, the build graph. And um, we could do this with IFD, of course, but there's, that has really uh, negative implications for remote builds. And it's also kind of shunned, I think. Um, there is um, dynamic derivations on the horizon, but unfortunately still not in a working state in um, the Nix implementation, as far as I know. Um, there's no support for cross-compilation because I just didn't get around to implement or even design support for that. Um, and it, yeah, if you work with C++, you probably know about the file compile commands, JSON, that basically is needed to um, get your Clang D, your, your um, uh, yeah, LSP to work. And without LSP, it's kind of annoying to work on these code bases. Um, but before we add features, or I add features, um, I need to fix some other stuff. So if you have a real project with a lot of inputs, the, comp the performance kind of suffers. Because every time you invoke this, you have to evaluate, evaluate all the Nix code, basically all the dependencies that come in from Nix packages. Um, you have to re-evaluate that every time. And normal build systems or traditional build systems don't do that. They build the make files once and then you re-invoke just make or just ninja all the time. And you do a lot less work at those steps. And this split is probably quite smart and um, something that should be considered in the evolution of the design. Um, obviously, this can't be used in Nix packages because you can't use recursive Nix in Nix packages, as far as I know, at least. Um, won't work with Hydra because um, you have to read in these um, dependency files outputs in the next run. Or maybe it will, because if with Hydra, you could just run um, a regular Nix build and don't have to deal with any of the uh, incremental stuff. So normally, just running Nix build on the same uh, project would also work. You just don't get the extra features. Um, yeah, as I already told you, um, with multiple uh, multiple builders, there's a lot of overhead, and it partially lacks early cutoff. So early cutoff is um, a term coined, I think, by the um, build systems a la carte paper, and this just describes when you have an output that is identical to an earlier output um, that you can stop and uh, cut down the build graph. With um, Nix, that also works if you have um, CA deriv derivations turned on. But because these dev files outputs are necessary to um, be read back in, you can't do that. Because at that point, um, if you enable CA derivations, the thing starts doing IFD, essentially. And that's something I don't want. So only at building executables and libraries, more specifically, um, you can enable content address derivations and have the benefit there, but not for individual objects. And yeah, that's it. Thanks. And questions? Uh, 
sorry, I might be missing, missing something basic, but why is the uh, object DB necessary? Why cannot we just use uh, NickStore itself to store what was, what is built and what's not? Because when you have uh, on your file system a tree and you invoke a Nix command, a part of the tree gets copied to the Nix store, but you don't have an easy way to find the previous tree where you ran Nix make or Nix build before. With, uh, you, you mentioned the, uh, the JSON file, uh, compile command something. So you mentioned that for Nix make to uh, provide this file to other uh, consumers. But would it make sense to uh, use like CMake to generate that file and then make a similar system like, as in order not to rewrite the full uh, things we do usually and take this and uh, ingest this uh, compile command that JSON in, and give that to Nix? I mean, there is definitely uh, quite a few different options in the design space in general. Um, you could just keep CMake um, and maybe implement a generator um, that that builds Nix expressions instead of make files and evaluate that. And then you still have compile commands JSON for free. But compile commands JSON you basically only need for running your LSP daemon. And um, this is something that certainly NixMake could also provide, but uh, I haven't implemented that. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. Uh, second question: uh, Do you have uh, uh, think about uh, using that in a dependency graph? Like, if I have one NixMake project and another NixMake project should depend on the first, what happens then? Uh, that should definitely work because the outputs are can normally be, I guess, libraries. You, you uh, use NixMake to, to generate one library. And um, actually, I didn't show that because, as I said, it doesn't really fit on a slide and it wouldn't be readable. But there's also a function to build a library, just like an executable. And a library needs to be consumable, obviously. And um, there you pass additional parameters um, that get injected so that a consumer knows how to consume that library correctly. Like what flags are needed to link that correctly, what um, include directories are there, what um, additional definitions are necessary when you compile that against the, the headers, the interface of the library. Um, and you can consume it basically from any kind of project because it uses PKG config as the common denominator, um, which is quite widely supported. Um, most modern build systems support that, and even auto tools um, are often built in a way that it evaluates PKG config files. And um, yeah, the, the library function also basically also creates a PKG config in its output. So any build system that supports this um, PKG config system will be able to consume these libraries. I may not have misunderstood something, but or not got it, but does this then, like, do you re-implement the make file in Nix, or is it just reading the make file and then do all the magic? Um, it's not really reading the make file in Nix. It's actually a really ugly six lines of bash code to convert the output of the make file that gets generated from the compiler, which the, with this M flags, it actually those are make files or partial make files. And it converts them into JSON so that I can use them from Nix. So it's completely, there's no make in there, there's no CMake in there, there's no CCache in there, it's all Nix. All right, thank you very much. Let's give our speaker another round of applause.